Our scripture reading today is found from the book of the Revelation, chapter 8. The book of Revelation, chapter 8, verses 2 through 4, and we'll read from the English Standard Version together. Will you stand, please, for the reading of God's Word? Revelation 8, 2 through 4. Reading together. Then the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Thank you. You may be seated, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his own holy word. Now, they say that the art of preaching is uh, taking God's word and proclaiming it through your own personality, the personality with which God has blessed you, or in some of our instances, cursed us. I include myself in that last remark. But Having said that, I want you to know that every morning when I pray, one of my prayers is that God will, well, here, I'll, I'll just tell you what it is. It, uh, it's uh, Almighty God, forgive me all of my sins through the Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen me in all goodness. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, and here I modified the words from what is one of the prayers from the medieval church. May I be a life-giving presence. May I be a life-giving presence. When I walk into a room, may I breathe life into it. When I meet people, may faith, hope, and love flow from me into their lives. But may I just be a life-giving presence. Consequently, when I open the Bible to Revelation chapter 8, and I read passages of Scripture like this, and feel that my responsibility as a pastor is to preach the whole counsel of God, including these passages that are judgmental in nature, it's uh, somewhat of a difficulty. But I want to give you a word of encouragement from the chapter today. There are several words of encouragement, and we'll get to those at the end. But here's the one from our scripture reading. The prayers of the saints rose before God. The prayers of the saints rose before God. Man, if there's nothing else, you get out of the service today. May you go home with that truth gripped in your heart, and may it grip you, and may it become part and parcel of your experience as a Christian person. The prayers of the saints rise before God. Your prayers are not in vain. Your prayers don't just hit the ceiling and stop there. Your prayers rise before God, And may that encourage you today as it will encourage the people of Revelation 8 when this time comes to pass. In 1743, as I recall, the London premiere of Handel's Messiah was presented. And in the London premiere... King George II was present. And to those of you who have heard this most rapturous and beautiful piece of music, written in a very short period of time by uh, Handel, a German composer, when it was presented in London, The king, as your experience also has been, was deeply moved, not only by the majestic sound of the orchestra, 
but by the powerful words of Scripture used throughout from beginning to end of the Messiah. The first portion talking about the first advent, the second portion, the second advent. And so finally, when the strains of the hallelujah chorus, the grand finale were presented, King George II was so moved that he stood in honor of Christ and everyone else in the auditorium seeing the king in his private balcony suite standing stood as well. And so from that time to this, when that powerful piece of music is presented, we stand in honor of he who is king of kings and lord of lords, and he shall reign forever and ever. In Revelation chapter 8, we read these words, when he opened the seventh seal. Now, if you're studying along with me and not just coming to listen to the sermons, but studying along, you know that there are scrolls and trumpets and modern versions of the Bible say bowls, but the King James uses the word vial. And sometimes we get those all confused and we think, oh, seven, this, seven, that. So I can't keep it straight. Remember your alphabet. You learned it in first grade, didn't you? S, T, U, V. So we have scrolls, S, trumpets, T, vials, V. And that's the sequence in which they are presented in each judgment is more profound than the one before. We're coming now to the trumpet judgments. The seventh seal is open on that scroll. The seal judgments. Did I say scrolls? Seals. And there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now, as I read that and as I thought about that verse, I couldn't help but think, of the hallelujah chorus, I, I, it just came to me. Because there is, at the very conclusion of that hallelujah chorus, silence. And with great anticipation, those who are in the audience await the final hallelujah. But for a moment in time, there is that silence with great anticipation. And that's what this is. It's the silence of anticipation. It's the silence of shock, horror. Have you ever walked into a room and been either horrified or shocked to where you just... <gasps> Sometimes it's a surprise. Happy birthday. <gasps> Sometimes it's a tragedy. <gasps> I can remember not that long ago when Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast and I was sitting on a sofa in our family room with the news live broadcast, live broadcast showing the dams keeping Lake Pontchartrain back from New Orleans breaking and water coming over those dams. And I thought for sure that New Orleans was gone forever. But I can remember seeing that visual impact and thinking, what can I say in such a time? What can I say? What can be said? And that seems to be the attitude of heaven. Now, our context, for those of you who are guests, we're looking, the church has been taken out of the world, and we're looking back on earth after the church has gone out of the world. And so there is this silence of anticipation and even of horror. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God we know a couple of their names, Gabriel and Michael. Apocryphal writings. 
Some churches have in their Bibles what is called the Apocrypha. We don't. They were never recognized as inspired writings. They were recognized by the early councils of the church as having content worth knowing, historical content, but they were not considered inspired, and so the word apocrypha was given to them, which means doubtful. We doubt that they are inspired, but they have some value, so they're worth reading. So an uninspired writing, which probably came from the imagination of an author, an apocryphal writing, tells us who these seven angels are. But that's doubtful. The scriptures, this book that was undoubtedly inspired and said so by the the early churches, Council of Carthage, as I recall, said, we know this is inspired. We don't know about that one. We know this one. We know these are inspired, recognized as such by the early church, acknowledged and accepted as such by the early church. We know two of their names from the inspired writings, Gabriel and Michael. But there are seven of them. And to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And, as I mentioned, the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now this is a powerful passage of scripture. And we want to remember that at this point, God's interest has returned to the nation of Israel. And we've already seen that 144,000 elect Jewish persons will accept Christ and go throughout the world proclaiming the gospel. The same gospel that John the Baptist proclaimed, the gospel of the kingdom. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom is going to come very, very soon. No. This passage for some reason, made me think of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, two infamous cities found in Genesis 19, were of course condemned by God for their unbelief and their sin. And it's a very interesting story, and it's worth knowing, because even though the specific cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are now buried at the south end of the Dead Sea, covered with water in Israel. By the way, they were still visible. The ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah were still visible in the first century. Sometimes we don't know that. But in the days of Jesus, when Jesus used the term, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, the people who were alive, when he said that and heard that, if they wanted to, could go down there and look at the ruins which no one inhabited afterward because of the stigma of Sodom and Gomorrah and of the fact that they had so strayed from God's truth and God's ways that they had invited God's judgment upon them and people just didn't want anything to do with it. And then finally they sunk and the Dead Sea swallowed them over and they're under the waters of the Dead Sea at the southernmost end. Genesis 14 tells us that the Valley of Sidim, that's where Sodom and Gomorrah were located, south of the Dead Sea. Genesis 14 says they were filled with, and as I recall, the King James says tar pits. In other words, it was a place where petroleum, oil, 
was so abundant that it just kind of seeped up to the top. And you had this oil mixed with these rocks and these minerals, and they were proliferate. So that when God said the time is right to bring judgment, he created an earthquake, and with that earthquake came volcanic eruptions, and with all that came fire and brimstone from all that petrol and the, the gunk that was with it in these tar pits, and it just rained down, as the Bible says, fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. Have you ever seen a news report of one of these refineries when they blow up or they catch on fire? That's what petrol does. And that's where Sodom and Gomorrah were located. And so it just explodes fire and brimstone and destroys the cities. God's judgment. Now the reason I say that is you will notice that God uses some of the elements of nature to bring down his judgment upon people, upon sin. Later, you would like to think that everyone would have learned from Sodom and Gomorrah, wouldn't you? But later, Isaiah the prophet. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19, is about 1,800 years before Christ. I'm giving you a ballpark figure. About 1,800 years before Jesus. Isaiah is about 700, 750 years before Jesus. But in Isaiah chapter 3, part of Isaiah's proclamation to the nation Israel, verses 8 and 9 says, For Jerusalem has stumbled, and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. In other words, Where's the holiness in, this, in the lives of these people? Where are the holy things in the lives of the society? Where is God in their lives? He's gone, he's absent. They've turned away from him and pursued their own ways, or the ways of sin. And so Isaiah goes on and he says, their doings and their tongue are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory, which is a way of saying to provoke him. He's not going to put up with this. This is not going to last forever. The look on their faces witness against them. Now we can preach a sermon on that, can't we? Time takes a toll on people. If you've ever looked into the face of a senior citizen, you'll see what they call crease marks. Some of those crease marks will show you, here's a person who's content with himself and has smiled a lot. And some of those crease marks will show you a person who's had a lot of sorrow or anger or pain. It shows in their face. But whether you have crease marks or not, your face tells a lot about the condition of your heart. The look on their countenance witnesses against them. These people are sorrowful. These people are unhappy. These people are not finding the path of life, quite opposite, the path of death. But here's the remark. And they declare their sin as Sodom. Without getting too rough or too graphic, what this is telling us is they were talking about, bragging about, practicing sodomy and thought nothing of it. And they do not hide it. Woe to their soul, for they have brought evil upon themselves. They have brought evil upon themselves. So with that thought, we go back 
Revelin. Sometimes my mind works a little faster than my tongue. So now we go back to Revelation. Revelation chapter 8, where some very unfortunate judgments are going to fall. But this is what happens when we defy. Who is this angel of the Lord that we've read about in verses 3 and 4 and 5? Well, let's not forget that we have returned to the nation of Israel now as it uh, parades through earth following the rapture of the church. Chapter 4, the church is taken out of the world. The focus of God returns to the nation of Israel upon the earth. And so I think what we're looking at here is the angel of the Lord. This one who has the power to send these judgments upon the earth is the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, as Israel, the nation, was called out by God to be a witness to the other nations, and she failed to do that, hence the church called of all nations is commissioned to do that to all of the all the world, all the people groups of the world, all the ethnos, from which we get the word ethnic, all the ethnos, the peoples of the world is our commission. And all of those become part of the church to carry the gospel to their own people and beyond to other ethnic groups as well. The word nations is ethnos, the ethnic groups. It may or may not have a physical boundary. This is the United States, and this is Canada, and this is Mexico. It may or may not mean that, but it definitely means to the Anglos, to the African Americans, to the Mexicans, to all ethnic groups, take the gospel. That's the church. But Israel as a nation was commissioned to take the truth of the Lord to the other nations of the world. And they were led by a fiery cloud through the wilderness, a fire by night, a cloud by day. God offers the perfect provision for a people traveling through the desert. The cloud by day shielded them from the hot beating sun. The fire by night warmed them from the cold of the desert. My sister used to live in Southern California, and she would tell me that it gets up to 105 during the day, and it drops down into the low 50s at night. That in the day, she can hardly stand it without air conditioning, and at night, she sleeps with the windows up and a blanket. Well, that's the desert. That's the desert climate. But this fiery pillar was identified as Yahweh, the Lord. And he was called the angel of the Lord. Now this angel of the Lord was actually a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. And there are times he would come as an embodiment, a person. And this is particularly seen, for example, in the judges when he appears to Gideon is probably the best example, Judges 6. This man appears to Gideon. Gideon's threshing his wheat. The people of Israel have departed from the Lord. God has seen Gideon's heart and knows that he's capable of leading the people back to God and faith in God. So a person appears to Gideon while he's threshing wheat, by the way, in a cave where no one can see him. And the Midianites, who would wait until harvest time and come over and raid the fields of the Israelites, would not know he was there. And says, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. I love the way he approaches Gideon. God knows the heart. And when he says to Gideon, thou mighty man of valor, Gideon says, 
There must be someone else around here. You can't be talking to me. I'm hiding in the cave. I'm afraid. God, uh, well, the angel of the Lord says, hey, don't be afraid. Do this and this and this. Well, how do I know this is God's word? How do I know? You just happen to walk in here and say these complimentary remarks to me and tell me to go out and deliver the people. How do I know that God has really sent this message to you? And then there's the story of Gideon's fleece, which I'm sure you've heard. But then finally, the angel appear, uh, re, uh, disappears. Poof, he's gone. And Gideon says, oh my heavens, this angel of the Lord has appeared. I have seen God. This angel of the Lord is God himself. It was Jesus in a pre-incarnate state. So we read these words from Revelation chapter 8, and we understand that this is probably the angel of the Lord who's receiving these prayers, who's uh, casting these judgments upon the earth. And the prayers of the saints rose before God. What prayers might that be? This is conjecture. I think they're all the prayers, but conjecturally, I think there is one specific prayer that is now being answered. And it's been prayed by Christians since the day of Pentecost. And that prayer is this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You ever heard that phrase? Of course you have. We've all recited it at one time or another. It's a familiar refrain from what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer, although it is a model prayer. It was prayed by the earliest Christians following the ascension of Christ into heaven. It's been prayed for over 2,000 years by followers of Jesus. Some churches make it a practice to recite it on almost a weekly basis in their worship service. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. Here now the answer to that prayer is being implemented. Here now we start to move toward that end. When Christ's kingdom will come. When God's will shall be done on earth even as it is in heaven. But as I said, that's my opinion. Verse 7. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood. And they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Now, various commentators on this passage of Scripture will try to influence the reader by saying that some sort of cosmic disturbance brings this to the earth, and maybe they're right. As I said in my study of Sodom and Gomorrah, I know there were tar pits, Genesis 14, and all God had to do was basically blow it up, and there you go, fire and brimstone rained down. Of course, the timing is a miracle. But all that aside, please notice that the time of judgment has arrived, and a third of the trees were burned up, all the green grass was burned up, and while the text doesn't say it, I think it's safe to assume all of the crops, a third of the crops, a third of all the food harvest is burned up as well. 
wow, this is devastating. This is bad news. And there is no reason not to take this literally. Some of you may own a Bible with a footnote or you'll go home and consult a commentary that you purchased, I hope, years ago and not recently because you've wasted your money that might tell you this is all figurative, don't pay any attention to it. Don't you believe that? God's judgment is harsh and it's real. And these are people who are denying God. These are people who are resisting the truth. But now a third of vegetation is removed from the world. But it gets worse. Like those advertisements on TV. About one night a month, sometimes two, I have trouble sleeping. I have to tell you, some of the most hilarious TV ads I've ever seen in my life come on between about 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. But wait, there's more! Order now, and we'll throw in another one. So we read this, and we say, man, that's awful. A third of all the crops and the trees and the forests. You talk about global climate change. Hey, we're going to see it. But wait, there's more. Then the second angel sounded. And something like a great mountain burning with fire. Now this is the best John can do to describe it. it. Was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. What would you think? How would you describe a fiery ball coming from heaven in this vision and landing in the sea and killing one third of the marine life? How would you describe that? You would probably describe something like that as a great mountain burning with fire. This is probably a meteor or a comet or something along those lines that God is permitting to hit earth. And I want to add to the text again. I added to the first trumpet judgment the crops are destroyed. I'll add to this one. Shipping is destroyed. How are our shipping, how are these large ships that move cargo from one continent to the other supposed to navigate through these waters? And if this hits a strategic location in the commercial routes of these great cargo ships, imagine what is lost to people. No wonder we saw with the four horsemen that famine is characteristic of the tribulation age. Many of those cargo ships, as you know, they don't just move cars from Japan to the U.S. They move food supplies, grains, rice, potatoes, and things of that nature. But wait, there's more. Then the third angel sounded, verse 10, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. Wow. Now, I don't know for sure, and again, the scriptures don't say this, but I have to believe that's North America. In fact, I further believe it's our region of North America, the Great Lakes regions, where most of the world's fresh water is found. But again, I don't know that. But I do know the judgment is coming. And now people will have contaminated water if they have it at all. The name of the star is wormwood, a word that means bitter. It's a, it's a tree, small a brush that grows in the, the Middle East, 
and uh, they make tea from it. It's a herbal tea. It's considered uh, medicinal in value, but it's bitter, has a bitter taste. This is bitter. The waters become wormwood, a third of them do. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter, that is, contaminated. Wow. And again, we're reminded of those four horsemen. The, the four horsemen are the broad sweep of what's coming. No specifics, broad generalities, but one of those horsemen is death. And hell follows right behind. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. Well, what in the world is this? This is a darkening of the skies. All of what has occurred now on earth with Meteors falling, stars falling, and hail and fire. One of the commentators said that in his opinion this represents radiation or nuclear destruction. And it might. But with all of this going on, it affects even the cosmos. At least our ability to see the cosmos. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now there are seven trumpets, and we've only seen four. So what this angel was saying, five, six, and seven are even worse. Whoa, whoa, whoa to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Well, what do we make of this? Here's what we make of this. God's judgment has fallen. And he's preparing the world for the time of the return of Christ to establish his kingdom. Here are some conclusions which I've drawn from Revelation 8 this week. Does the concept of God's judgment frighten you good it should throughout the pages especially of the Old Testament the prophets come to the people who are living in unbelief and sin and doing despicable things and the prophets say hey if you don't change your ways, judgment is going to fall upon you. God is not going to put up with this nonsense forever. But if the idea of judgment frightens you, then good. That means you have a conscience, and there is hope for you. Several years ago, I worked for a period of four months. Please don't think I'm an expert. But four months can teach you a lot when you work with men who are on parole from prison. And I did. And I tried to speak with them, and I wanted to pray with them, and so on. And they talk. They talk freely. Through that four months period of time, I probably met and spoke with 60 fellows. That's the best estimate I can come up with, with my recall. They would come, they would go, they would come, they would go. There was a lot of turnover. A lot of them wanted to go back to prison. At least they had a structured life there. They didn't know how to handle life on the street, so to speak, free. They don't know how to handle freedom, some of them. But here's the point I'm getting to. Of those approximately 60 men I met who were on parole from prison, only one, only one, one in four months of time ever said, I did it, and I got what I deserved. That was the one for whom there was hope. And the reason there was hope for him is because he was being 
honest, honest with himself, honest with me, honest with his parole officer, honest with a prospective employer. He was being honest. Be honest with yourself. Is there some part of your life that needs to change? Then change it. It is supposed to frighten us and scare us away from doing wrong so that we might do what is right. Second point, judgment sobers us. It should make us think seriously about our lives. Does my life count? Am I doing something for others that will make life better for them, that will turn them to God? Judgment, the thought of judgment, sobers us. It makes us reassess our way of living. C.S. Lewis, in his works, Mere Christianity is his monumental work, and I believe it's in Mere Christianity where C.S. Lewis reminds us that judgment, fear, and especially pain are God's megaphone for reaching an otherwise deaf world. God whispers to us, is the way Lewis used to put it, God whispers to us in our pleasures and he shouts to us in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone for talking to a deaf world. Don't be deaf to God. Thirdly of all, judgment humbles us. We realize we are not in control of our own circumstances. Hasn't someone said insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result? Yes, someone has said that, and it's been repeated so many times that the original source is now unknown. But it's true. Insanity is repeating the same behavior over and over and expecting a different result. What makes you think that you are so smart or you are so clever or you're so, you are such a genius that you can do this and get away with it. You won't. You simply will not. Be sure your sin will find you out. The words of God to Moses and Moses to the people of Israel. There is a natural order, a moral order of things by which eventually the truth is known. Judgment humbles us. It reminds us that we are not truly in control of our circumstances. God is in control. And fourthly of all, judgment reassures us. It reminds us that all of the injustices that we have experienced, all of the slander that we have endured, all of the heartache that we have borne, but someday, be rectified. God will make things right. And he will. He will for you. He will for me. And he will for the nation of Israel during this time. Let us pray, shall we?